Good evening. Welcome to Northwest, a Unitarian Universalist congregation. And I wish to welcome you all to the annual candlelight service. My name is Kevin DeBeck. Uh, I am the Reverend Kevin DeBeck. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, and his. And if you are a visitor here and would like to stay in touch, we would like to stay in touch with you, please fill out the visitor form you will see in the chat box. The chat feature has been disabled except for chatting directly with the tech host. If you're having problems with Zoom, use the chat function or the raise hand function in Zoom or, you know, get someone's attention. You are encouraged to change your pronouns on Zoom. To change your name, click on the participants button at the top of the Zoom window. Next, hover your mouse over your name in the participants list on the right side of the Zoom window and then click on rename. Good evening. Today's opening words, Christmas Eve is a time for candlelight, come to us from Reverend Tracy Pullman. Christmas Eve is not a time to be merry, but quietly glad. It is the proper time to wish upon a star. It is the time to watch children with excited, happy eyes troop off to bed to await the miracle of the dawn. It is a time of wonder of thankfulness that life is still being created anew out of darkness. It is a time of quiet awakening to beauty that still lives on through the strife of a war-torn world. And we burn candles, for this is Christmas Eve. 
Christmas Eve is a time of heartbreak when those who are not at their own fireside are most missed. Christmas Eve is a time of blessing when all the heartbroken world gives thanks for the quiet beauty of rest when one is closest to one's companions and is not then enemy to any person. And we burn candles for this is Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve is a time of memory when one remembers past happiness and love and often sighs for the good that might have been. Peace on earth, and now comes the memory of the story of the first Christmas, so old and yet so new. We lose ourselves in legend and dream of storybook people, tiny Tim and the other wise man. Live again in the memory of human hearts, and we burn candles, for this is Christmas Eve. for this evening is by the Reverend Beatrice Hitchcock. The flaming chalice is the symbol of Unitarian Universalism. It is an everlasting flame for this community. It offers its warmth to those who are cold. It provides light to those who see. It purifies and transforms this sanctuary into sacred space this congregation into sacred community. May its flame burn true and high and strong. Now is the hour when we turn darkness to light. Now is the hour when we assemble those we love. Now is the hour when we kindle memory's flame. The shamus is the tall one, responsible for lighting the rest. At first, these candles were oil, throwing shadows on ancient temple walls. At first, we were few fanatics define darkness and desecration. At first, our candles were lit by those who knew that the shamus is the tall one, responsible for lighting the rest. In the tinder of our patchwork nation, our small celebration has ignited beyond its birth into a flare of identity and remembrance. We who are Jews use blazing menorahs to find our way in the blinding dazzle of Christmas. We pump our eight days of dreidel and gout like bellows to show we too can offer fuel for December's joy. Even when we know little else of our own story, we take out our necklace of lights and dress for winter, writing new chapters in this young land that is now our home. The shamus is the tall one, responsible for lighting the rest. But even if you have no memories of beloved elders chanting a guttural holy tongue while holding the shamus aloft at dusk, the menorah compels us all to consider how centuries change stories, how celebrations reflect as much as preserve, and how we shape consecration of our rituals. We can all remember that it takes only a candle to light the way for each other. It takes only a candle to gather us together. It takes only a candle to set alight the bonfire of memory. 
The shamus is the tall one, responsible for lighting the rest. Light one candle for the Maccabee children, with thanks that their light didn't die. Light one candle for the pain they endured when their right to exist was denied. And light one candle for the terrible sacrifice justice and freedom demand. And light one candle for the wisdom to know when the peacemaker's time is at hand. Don't let the light go out for so many years. Don't let the light go out. Let it shine through our love and our tears. Don't let the light go out. It's lasted for so many years. Don't let the light go out. Let it shine through our love and our tears. Light one candle for the strength that we need to never become our own foe. Light one candle for those who are suffering pain we learned so long ago. Light one candle for all we believe in. Let anger not tear us apart. And light one candle bind us together with peace as the song in our hearts. Don't let the light go out, it's lasted for so many years. Don't let the light go out, let it shine through our love and our tears. Don't let the light go out, it's lasted for so many years. Don't so highly, we keep it alive in the flame. That's the commitment for those who have died, we cry out they've not died in vain. We have come this far, always believing that judgment will somehow prevail. This is the burden, this is the promise, this is why we will not fail. Don't let the light go out. It's lasted for so many years. Don't let the light go out. Let it shine through our love and our tears. Don't let the light go out. It's lasted for so many years. Don't let light go out, let it shine through our love and our tears. Don't let the light go out, don't let the light go out, don't let the light go out, don't let the light go out. This reading is from the book, It's Kwanzaa Time, adapted by Linda and Clay Goss. It came from the seventh day of Kwanzaa, which is Imani, which means faith. And it's called, Keep the Faith, Baby, Imani. Keep the faith, baby, that's the thing to do. Believe in yourself and your family too. Keep the faith, baby, that's the bottom line. If you really want to make it, then it's going to take time. It took 60 years and 600 miles for Clara Barton to find her slave child. It took guts and courage 
let the truth be told for Harriet Tubman to work the Underground Railroad. It took a lawyer named Marshall and a little girl named Brown for the court to the Supreme Court to strike school segregation down. It took most of a lifetime dedication and knowledge for Mary McLeod Bethune to build a college. And it took hours and hours of hard work and pain for Muhammad Ali to become champion again. It took 27 years, but he still prevailed and Nelson Mandela walked out of jail. So keep the faith, baby. That's the thing to do. Imani is believing your dreams will come true. So when you get up in the morning or before you go to bed, let the four special words pop out of your head. Keep the faith, baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep the faith, baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, celebrate and rejoice. It's Spreading unity in our families and communities. Because the legacy makes us so strong. Yeah, yeah. So let us come together to celebrate this season of Come so far, remembering all of those who came before us on Kwanzaa. From Rosa to Malcolm to Dr. King and Turner, yeah. From Du Bois to Yah Ashantiwa, we honor you on Kwanzaa. As we move this evening to the celebration of Advent, we have this explanation from Christianity.com. 
The word advent is derived from the Latin word adventus, meaning coming, which is a translation of the Greek word parousia. Scholars believe that during the fourth and fifth centuries in Spain and Gaul, Advent was a season of preparation for the baptism of new Christians at the January Feast of Epiphany, the celebration of God's incarnation represented by the visit of the Magi to the baby Jesus. During this season of preparation, Christians would spend 40 days in penance, prayer, and fasting to prepare for the celebration. Originally, there was little connection between Advent and Christmas. By the sixth century, however, Roman Christians had tied Advent to the coming of Christ. It was not until the Middle Ages that the Advent season was explicitly linked to Christ's first coming at Christmas. We close our words about Advent with this writing from Reverend David Breeden, the UU minister at First Unitarian Society in Minneapolis, Minnesota. In this holiday season, may we find peace inside ourselves. May we be peace for those around us. And may we renew our commitment to bring peace with justice to our community and the world. May we be peace. I now invite you to listen and to sing along with members of the Northwest Choir to deck the halls. It's called Alfie the Christmas Tree, which was written by John Denver. And if you are a certain age, you'll know that uh, he did this when he did a very special Muppet Christmas with the Muppets as a special in the late 70s. Did you ever hear the story of the Christmas tree who just didn't want to change the show? He liked living in the woods and playing with squirrels. He liked icicles and snow. He liked wolves and eagles and grizzly bears and critters and creatures that crawled. Why, bugs were some of his best friends, spiders and ants and all. Now, that's not to say he ever looked down on the vision of twinkling lights or on mirrored bubbles and peppermint canes or a thousand other delights. He often had dreams of tiny reindeer and a jolly old man with a sleigh full of toys and presents and wonderful things and the story of Christmas Day. Oh, Alfie believed in Christmas all right. He was full of Christmas cheer all of each and every day and all throughout the year. To him, it was more than a special time, much more than a special day. It was more than a beautiful story. It was a special kind of way. You see, some folks never heard a jingle bell ring and they've never heard of Santa Claus. They, never, they have never heard of the story of the Son of God and that made Alfie pause. Did that mean they'd never know of peace on earth or the siblinghood of humanity? or know how to love or how to give 
if they can't, no one can. You see, life is a very special kind of thing, not just for a chosen few, but for each and every living, breathing thing, not just me and you. So in your Christmas prayers this year, Alfie asked me if I'd asked you to say a prayer for the wind and the water and the wood and for those who live there too. Before we have the great pleasure of hearing from our choir as they sing the work of Christmas, I want to remind you that this is the one time in the year when our offering goes strictly to the minister's discretionary fund, which is used to help congregants who are, have hit a rough patch in their lives. So I encourage you to be as generous as you can this evening.
The Christmas story we will hear this evening is from the book of Luke in the New International Version of the Christian Bible. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was the governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph went up to the town of Nazareth in Galilee and Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that there will be a great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen them, they spread the word concerning what they had been told them about this child and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds had said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things in her heart and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. And now our choir will sing Angels We Have Heard on High.
Welcome to you all to our candle light service, and I am very happy to be doing this live in the sanctuary with the hopes that a year from now, most of you can be here as well. So this is the first time I've participated in something quite like this, and it got me to thinking about what is it that all of these December holidays have in common? And what they all have in common is, is that they all bring light or talk about light or bringing light back. And I think this speaks to the human need for sunlight and how, at least in northern climates, there is more nightfall than sunlight at this time of year. You can't have one without the other, but the balance has been thrown off. It brought to mind the Taoist symbol of, a, the yin, of yin yang, the philosophy of balance between two seemingly opposite objects. The nature of human life is to find the right balance of everything that's around us, the right balance of food to eat, the right balance of what we drink on a daily basis, the right balance of entertainment versus work. That should be done and on and on and on. I think most of our human existence is spent trying to find the right balance of everything that we do in our daily lives. Now, we all know what it feels like when we're out of balance. We've been out of balance for much of the last year and a half, partially due to the rise in fascism that we see around us, and which is tied to the rise of the immoral behavior we see among our fellow Americans, and the uncertainty of COVID and wondering if it will ever really go away. I have felt this frustration, and I'm sure many of you have too, uh, when we realize that if anybody, that if everyone who is eligible for a vaccination, if they had gotten it, it wouldn't be like this right now. Sometimes it's enough to want to bang one's head against the wall. So how does one find balance in a time when everything is seemingly out of whack? For the holidays, we have a human need to light trees and logs and menorahs and canaras to bring more light back into our lives. It's literally hardwired into our brains. My son suffers from seasonal depression and along with the medication he takes, takes to combat it, he sits in front of a sun lamp, sun lamp for 40 minutes a day to rebalance how much sunlight and nightfall he experiences on a daily basis. So it's no wonder we find a variety of ways to light stuff on fire to bring this balance back. As a result of us growing up and living in an industrialized capitalist time in global history, people and corporations want to sell us on the idea that overindulgence at this time of year is not only a given, but expected. Too much food, too much adult beverages, too much time with family members that might not be healthy for us, where instead of a better balance for us was the expectation, maybe we all would be a little happier and our own credit card bills wouldn't be so overwhelming come January. If we could zoom out even further and look at this idea of balance at a global level, if we were more in balance with, it, with our earth, perhaps we wouldn't be suffering from the effects of climate change that creates tornadoes in December, bigger and more powerful hurricanes, and at times, extreme cold with the sometimes accompanying snowfall. Our country and our society it, it, are in a deep reckoning when it comes to balance. Over the course of the last year and a half, COVID has helped many Americans realize that working jobs with low pay and few benefits and dealing with bosses and customers that feel free to be abusive is no longer desirable, especially when there are better options. Even among so-called white collar jobs, folks are looking at themselves in the mirror and asking, is this job worth my time? COVID has reminded us of our mortality, so why spend one's life working at or for something that isn't fulfilling? This time is being called the great resignation, and it's doing things that organized labor hasn't had much luck with over the past 40 years. It's helping people to stand up to the greed and excess of those at the top, and who, oh, at the top who use people to be exploited for their own gain. And people are finally saying enough. For decades in response to labor strife, uh, right wingers have flippantly said, well, if you don't like where you're looking, go find another job. Well, they're finally taking that advice. There are other signs as well. 
And these are some examples. Recently, there was a strike at John Deere and that netted, and at the end of it, when it was finally settled, it netted a signing bonus for new employees and a 10% raise in the first year of their contract. A couple of Starbucks stores in Buffalo, New York have organized for the first time. They also tried to organize an Amazon warehouse in Alabama, and while the vote failed, there is now an investigation looking into how that vote might have been tampered with. Here in Michigan, uh, workers at the Kellogg's plant in Battle Creek are striking where workers have worked 80 hour weeks during the pandemic while the CEO earned $11 million. $11 million. And for the record, none of us should buy anything associated with Kellogg's to stand in solidarity with these folks. In fact, uh, the CEO has threatened to bring in scabs to try to break the strike and break the union. As we are trying to pull our society back into balance, those that prefer the status quo are doing their own pulling, which has led to voter suppression laws and the rise in political violence in such places as school board uh, meetings, which also, of course, has ties to white supremacy. I suspect that life is going to continue to, to feel tumultuous while all of this gets sorted out. And as this sorting is taking place, what can we do to feel more balanced within ourselves? In doing research to find a good answer for this question, I came across a nonprofit organization called Centerstone, which runs a series of mental health treatment centers all over the country. They recommend these six steps. The first one, acknowledge and accept that you cannot do everything all the time. Number two, manage yourself, not time. It's a common joke in ministry circles that it's clear when it's sermon writing day because the house gets really clean on those days. It's about managing one's activities, not necessarily time, because time moves at its own pace regardless of what we are doing. Number three, add and subtract. And this is a direct quote from the article. It says, to do more of one thing, you must do less of others. You must be willing to cut some activities from your schedule, even if just temporarily, in order to accomplish your higher priorities. When planning your week, determine which less important tasks or projects can wait. Subtract these from your weekly to-do list and feel a sense of being overwhelmed lessen automatically. Number four, just say no. And if you grew up in the 1980s, that, whole, that had an entirely different meaning. Now this article states that sometimes we say yes to things because we feel pressure to give an immediate answer. However, always remember you have the right to take some time to think about what you can reasonably, reasonably do before responding. Five, schedule time for yourself. Or as the article says, if you don't take care of yourself, who will. Six, live with purpose. A life oriented around an authentic and passionate purpose is one that is much easier to keep in balance. And I would add one more. Find a community of folks who share similar values. Humans were not meant to live in a vacuum. If one is having trouble finding balance in life, a community of people can help with this search. And as we leave this place today, either here or online, my hope for us all is that we find the balance that will create peace within ourselves, which may help create the peace in our society and in the greater world in general. I wish you all the happiest and the most balanced of holiday seasons. And now we've come to the part that probably you all have been waiting for. If you have your candle at home, Go ahead and light it right now. For the rest of us in here, we will light it as we go along. So our, one, our closing carol will be number 251, Silent Night.
when we're all lit. Oh, they won't see us. Happy holidays, everybody. <laughs> closing reading. I'm just waiting. One more thing. My closing reading this evening is The Work of Christmas by Howard Thurman. Now the work of Christmas begins when the song of the angels is stilled, when the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and princes are home, when the shepherds are back with their flocks, the work of Christmas begins <clears throat> to find the lost, to heal the broken, to feed the hungry, to release the prisoner, to rebuild the nations, to bring peace among people, and to make music in the heart. Amen. Our postlude, some may consider this song a Thanksgiving song, but it's over in the river and through the woods written by Lydia Maria Child, who was a Unitarian and one of the first women who was an abolitionist. And she's one of our Unitarian forebears. Happy holidays, everybody.